turn this on. Thank you. Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome my friend, the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister uh, Altani here to, uh, to Washington, um, and uh, all members of the uh, Qatari delegation. We're opening the fourth uh, Qatar-U.S. Uh, strategic dialogue and uh, great appreciation to all of our colleagues for the work that's uh, already gone into this and the work that is going to go into this uh, in the hours ahead. I think uh, if you look, uh, Mohammed, at the diversity of, of issues that we'll cover, it reflects a, a powerful reality, which is the growing strength of the relationship between the United States and Qatar, spanning shared security uh, and economic interests, cooperation on many regional challenges, and growing people-to-people -people ties, uh, among other things. Um, the events in Afghanistan over the past several months have reinforced that partnership. Uh, including in on the most sensitive and urgent uh, issues. Um, I had the opportunity to, to thank uh, Amir uh, Tamim in person for Qatar's extraordinary generosity, support, and cooperation uh, when I traveled to Doha in September and witnessed firsthand the massive joint operation to evacuate Americans, uh, foreign nationals, and Afghans who were our partners over our 20-year mission in Afghanistan. Of the more than 124,000 people evacuated from Afghanistan in August, roughly half transited through Qatar. Uh, and that work continues. Uh, since that time, Qatar has facilitated and funded an additional 15 flights and counting out of Afghanistan, enabling hundreds uh, of uh, U.S. citizens, thousands of others, uh, to leave the country. And the government uh, uh, and Qatar Airways continue to support charter flights out of Afghanistan for U.S. special immigrant visa holders and others. Uh, on that note, I can confirm that as of November 10th, all U.S. citizens who have requested assistance from the United States government to depart Afghanistan and who have, uh, we have identified as prepared to depart and having the necessary travel documents have been offered uh, an opportunity uh, to, uh, to do so. Uh, that includes more than 300 uh, America, 380, excuse me, American citizens and more than 280 legal permanent residents whose departure we have already facilitated. Uh, meanwhile, Qatar's support for operations at the airport in Kabul have allowed humanitarian assistance from the international community to flow into Afghanistan, uh, including several flights from the World Health Organization carrying life-saving medical uh, supplies for over 2 million Afghans. Uh, today, uh, we're signing two new agreements that reflect our deepening collaboration on Afghanistan. The first establishes Qatar as the United States protecting power in Afghanistan. Uh, Qatar will establish a U.S. interest section within its embassy in Afghanistan to provide certain consular services and monitor the condition and security of U.S. diplomatic facilities uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the second agreement formalizes our partnership with Qatar to facilitate the travel of Afghans with U.S. special immigrant visas, a role that it's already been playing in many instances, and serve as a transit point for eligible Afghans as they complete their application process. Uh, Mohammed, let me again say how grateful we are for uh, your leadership, your support uh, on Afghanistan, uh, but also uh, to, to note that our partnership is much broader uh, than that, and that's reflected in uh, the uh, very good conversation that we just had, the regular conversations that we have uh, on many issues of, of common concern uh, in the region and beyond. Uh, Qatar is a crucial partner in promoting regional stability, not only hosting U.S. troops who provide security across the region, but also providing significant economic and humanitarian assistance to people in dire situations. Over the last decade, Qatar has donated more than $1.3 billion in aid to Palestinians in Gaza and provided considerable support to the Yemeni people, including $100 million pledged in August and another 90 million uh, the Emir donated uh, just this week through the World Food Program. We're also working together on challenging issues like labor rights. We stand ready to support Qatar in ensuring the full implementation of its labor reforms, including ensuring that all workers in the country are covered by uh, the new minimum wage law and are able to uh, uh, change employers and leave the country without certificates and permits. So we're now preparing to mark the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between our nations. And I think it's fair to say that the Qatar-U.S. relationship has never been stronger. And we believe it will only grow deeper and more diverse to the benefit of our people uh, and so many others. And with that, over to you, Foreign Minister Altani. Mohammed.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you for the hospitality and warm welcome, Tony. I wish also to thank both delegations for their work and efforts in preparing this uh, uh, dialogue. The fourth Qatar-U.S. strategic dialogue represents another milestone in our historically strong partnership. The flourishing ties between our two countries, enabled by the mutual commitments of our two governments, demonstrated not only by wide scope of our cooperation, but also by the deep friendship between our nations. We are partners in defense, security, investments, education, and energy. And we are global leaders in the fight against terrorism. This is possible because our friendship spans decades across institutions. This year, our friendship become, become, became even closer when Qatar worked closely with the United States and our international partners around the clock to evacuate more than 60,000 individuals from Afghanistan, including American citizens, female students from across the country, Afghan employees and their families, and journalists from around the world. Qatar was honored to be in a trusted position to step up and rescue so many people, and we will continue to be an instrument of peace and stability in the region. There is still much to be done in Afghanistan, and Qatar remains committed to continue the necessary work alongside with the United States and partners around the world. We are dedicated to contributing to the stability of Afghanistan and the safety and well-being of the Afghan people. The strategic dialogue today will discuss issues of mutual interest and will reaffirm our determination to deepen our cooperation in various fields, including strengthening our defense and security partnership. Another pillar of our relationship is our commercial partnership. Qatar has invested hundreds of billions of dollars in the U.S. economy. These investments translates into tens of thousands of jobs across the U.S., and our economic partnership exceeded 200 billion U.S. dollars of trade and investments between our two countries. As a leading producer of natural gas, Qatar serves an important role in helping countries meet their energy needs while firmly believing in the importance of emission reduction measures through our global investment in green innovation and technologies alongside the Qatar environmental strategy. Our investments reflect our commitment to care for environment as of 2021, more than half of Qatar Investment Authority investments in power generation projects are zero emissions. Mr. Secretary, I'm grateful for our discussion today and for all your efforts. I look forward to expanding this extraordinary partnership. Today, our two nations are connected by deep political, cultural, military, and financial bonds and I believe our greatest opportunities are still ahead of us. The year 2022 will be a special one. It marks the 50th anniversary of our alliances between the United States and Qatar. And in November next year, Qatar will host the FIFA World Cup, which will be the first carbon neutral FIFA World Cup. This year, we also celebrate Qatar US Year of Culture which contain a number of events celebrating our long, friendly relationship across the years. I look forward to welcoming you and your team in Doha for the fifth strategic dialogue, and I personally invite you to watch a World Cup match together. So this is a good excuse for you to come to Doha, and I wish your U.S. team the best of luck tonight in Cincinnati. So you will visit us in Doha to watch the games there then. Thank you. That's a, that's a hard invitation to say no to. Thank you.
We'll now move to take questions from the media. The first question going to Humaira Pamek from Reuters. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Signing is complete. Over to Humera from Reuters. Good morning, Secretary Blinken, Sheikh Thani. Secretary Blinken, I'd like to start with you. I have a couple of questions. Um, you've already warned about the unusual Russian troop buildup in Ukrainian border. How imminent does the United States see a potential invasion of Ukraine by Russia? What will Washington do? On Belarus, its neighbors say the crisis is escalating towards a potential military clash. Will the United States join EU in sanctioning Belarus? And given Lukashenko is already sanctioned, why do you think it's going to work this time? Very quickly on China, ahead of Biden Xi summit, US and China work together in Glasgow, but how will US balance out cooperation with the obligation to call out on China's human rights abuses in Xinjiang? And Sheikh Thani, if I may, and Secretary Blinken, please feel, feel free to chime in as well on this one. Um, Sheikh Thani, you've called for more engagement with the Taliban to avoid the looming humanitarian catastrophe in Afghanistan. How unified are you with the United States in your approach? In that context, do you think the UN should consider delisting Taliban from the sanctions regime? Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm happy to start, uh, Mohammed, and then kick it over to you. Um, on, uh, on Russia, uh, as I said the other day, uh, we're very concerned about some of the uh, irregular movements of forces that we see on, uh, on Ukraine's borders. Um, I can't speak to um, Russia's intentions. We don't know uh, what they are. Uh, but we do know that uh, we've uh, seen in the past uh, Russia mass forces on Ukraine's borders um, claim some kind of provocation uh, by Ukraine uh, and then uh, invade, um, basically following through on something they were planning all along. That's what they did in 2014. Uh, and so this raises, uh, raises real concerns about uh, an effort to repeat uh, what, was done, uh, what was done then, uh, which, as I said the other day, would be a serious mistake. We're in very close consultation with uh, European allies and, and partners uh, on this. Uh, we, uh, of course, had the Ukrainians here uh, this week uh, and, uh, and, and, and talked about this. But I can't, uh, I can't tell you what's uh, in the mind of, uh, of President Putin, what his intentions are. I can just say that based on the past, uh, we have real concerns about what we're seeing uh, in the present, uh, and it would be uh, a serious mistake for Russia to uh, engage in a repeat uh, of, what it, uh, of what it did in 2014. Uh, there is a process agreed by both uh, Ukraine and Russia, the Minsk uh, process, that um, continues to offer, I think, the possibility of um, resolving uh, the differences and ending the, uh, the occupation uh, of parts of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, we would hope as well that uh, the, the parties would uh, recommit to that and take the uh, uh, necessary steps to make that, uh, make that real. But uh, what um, what is, uh, as I said, of real concern are some of the, the movements that we're, uh, we're seeing, uh, especially given what Russia has done in the past. Uh, with regard to Belarus, uh, again, as I said the other day, um, we are uh, also very concerned about the uh, efforts by Belarus to use migration as a, uh, as a political weapon. Uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, preview or get ahead of any, uh, of any possible uh, sanctions, but we are uh, looking at um, various tools that we uh, that we have, and of course, this is broader than the effort to use migration as a political weapon. It goes to uh, the conduct of the uh, Lukashenko uh, regime in uh, Belarus and denying the citizens of Belarus uh, 
uh, the democracy to which they're, uh, they're entitled. Uh, and there again, we're in very close uh, consultation with, uh, uh, with European allies uh, and partners on this uh, as well. Uh, and then finally, with regard to, uh, uh, to China, uh, look, uh, I will um, let, of course, the, uh, the President speak for, uh, for the administration. We've uh, noted uh, repeatedly uh, over the past 10 months that the relationship with China is among the most consequential and also most complex that we have. Uh, as uh, we've said, it has uh, uh, different uh, elements in it, uh, some cooperative, uh, some competitive, uh, and others uh, adversarial. And we, uh, we will uh, manage all, uh, all three um, at, uh, at the same time. Uh, I think um, uh, you'll see uh, in the engagements the President has already had with, uh, with President uh, Xi and the in engagements to come, uh, the work that, uh, that we're doing to, uh, to do that. I think uh, there are issues like climate that, uh, in a sense, uh, are incumbent on every country in the international community to meet its uh, responsibilities, irrespective of um, differences, even profound differences we have in other areas, simply because it's in the interest of each of these countries, including China, and it's in the interest of humanity. And we've seen some progress uh, coming out of, uh, of COP26 when it comes to China meeting its responsibilities uh, on climate change. A lot more to be done, uh, but this is profoundly in the interest of China's citizens as well as citizens around the world. Uh, and irrespective of any other uh, differences, including um, very uh, strongly felt principles that we will continue to stand for, um, I think we can still expect to see countries meet, uh, meet their responsibilities, including China. Um. Well, uh, regarding your question about uh, Afghanistan and engaging with Taliban, uh, our number one priority in Qatar is to make sure that the humanitarian assistance reaching the Afghan people, especially we are seeing the people suffering from this, uh, uh, they, and they have a dire need for uh, help, especially when, when the winter is coming. And there will be a lot of challenges in the humanitarian situation, and it's better for us uh, to help the Afghan people uh, over there now before things uh, get much worse. So. Uh, uh, the first priority uh, to be addressed with the Taliban uh, is to provide this safe access for humanitarian assistance and ensuring that it goes to the right people and not falling into the right, uh, wrong hands. The second thing, we believe that uh, abandoning uh, Afghanistan will be a big mistake and ignoring it because uh, isolation has never been an answer for or a solution for uh, for any issue and engagement is the only way forward so that's why we believe engaging with Taliban since they are in power right now is very important for us to ensure that uh, our facilitation for humanitarian assistance is moving smoothly and also encouraging them and urging them all the time to uh, stand up to, to their commitments and their pledges for the international community. Now, uh, we, we are in continuous consultation with the U.S. Uh, we have an agreement on a wide range of issues when it comes uh, to the Afghanistan and the way uh, to address the situation. And both of us, we agree on the needs of the Afghan people to, be, to ensure their safety and to protect them from uh, uh, whether uh, from any violence or any act uh, uh, by the people who are in power now, and also ensuring that the humanitarian situation, their humanitarian situation is addressed. Regarding enlisting Taliban uh, from uh, the sanction list, uh, this is, uh, was not Qatar a decision, this is a Security Council resolution which had its reason at that time. We believe that uh, the members of the Security Council are in continuous review for this. And this is, will be, or they will be enlisted only uh, by their own decision. So uh, Qatar has no uh, any role in this. We are encouraging the international community to keep engaging with Afghanistan and not to abandon Afghanistan, engaging with everyone over there and preventing any risks from uh, uh, emerging from Afghanistan. Next question from Ahmed Al-Hazim from Al Jazeera. 
Uh, I have uh, two questions for uh, Sheikh Thani and one question for Secretary Blinken. Uh, regarding uh, Afghanistan, Sheikh, you said you have, there is a lot of areas that they need urgent, urgent need for the Afghan people. And uh, I would just want to ask you, which certain area Qatar feels that she can play a role, especially in the areas that uh, the conditions of the international community to be for a Taliban to for uh, behavioral changes to be accepted internationally. And my second question is, uh, is Qatar looking for a medita mediator role in Ethiopia? Uh, for Secretary Blinken, regarding Lebanon and uh, the reforms needed from the international community and the pressure uh, uh, placed on the government there, do, does the United States see any progress happening or where did you reach with your uh, talk with the Lebanese government? And I apologize because I had a little trouble hearing. Could you just repeat that? Uh, the question, thank you. Uh, regarding reforms in Lebanon, the United States have been pushing the new government to uh, implement these reforms. Do you hear anything from them, any update, any progress? Well, uh, as uh, we mentioned, we have uh, seen an urgent humanitarian need in Afghanistan for the Afghan people, and basically, we believe that uh, these needs translate into food supplies, medicine, uh, health care services needs remain uh, running, and also the schools needs to uh, remain operational. So we are very much focused on those areas and trying to deliver uh, those aids for, for the right people over there. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, winter is going to be very challenging. Uh, in delivering uh, those humanitarian aid. So that's why we are urging and encouraging all uh, international organizations to step up uh, this time and to uh, try to uh, deliver it as soon as possible. And f uh, from our side as Qatar, we are trying our best to facilitate uh, for them and to contribute uh, to address those needs. Uh, regarding Ethiopia, of course, we are very much concerned about uh, the escalation over there in Ethiopia. The stability of uh, Eastern Africa and the Horn of Africa is very important for our regional stability, and we hope that uh, things are going uh, to be de-escalated and resolved as soon as possible. Uh, we normally, Qatar, when uh, it's playing a mediator role, uh, we always uh, been asked by the two parties of, of the conflict and with their consent, but as far as this conflict is concerned, no one has reached out uh, to Qatar, but we are happy to help and to support any international efforts in de-escalating the situation over there. And I believe there are a number of countries in, within the international community, including the United States, are working on, on these efforts, and uh, we are very much willing to support their efforts in that. Um, first, I appreciate the, the, the balance of two questions for Mohammed and one for me. That's the appropriate balance, so thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> so first, uh, on, on, um, uh, on Lebanon, let me uh, simply say two things. First, uh, there is, um, I think, a, a dire need that uh, the uh, Lebanese people have uh, that, needs, that needs to be addressed. Uh, we are working, uh, as you know, uh, on uh, arrangements to get fuel uh, in, into the country. The, it, its absence, uh, of course, has had very detrimental uh, effects on the ability to do the most basic things that citizens are looking for, uh, including keeping the, the, the hospitals up and running, uh, among the transportation, many other things. So uh, we're working on that. I think the prime minister has a, um, uh, a good plan uh, for moving uh, Lebanon forward, trying to move the economy forward. In the first instance, um, pursuing uh, work with the international financial institutions and the support that they can uh, that they can offer. At the same time, uh, we're looking to um, uh, ensure support for the uh, Lebanese armed forces, who are a, a source of stability uh, in the country. And uh, in all of these areas, uh, I think it would be very important for um, the various friends and supporters of Lebanon to, uh, uh, to demonstrate that support, to um, bolster Lebanon in a time of need, to give it an opportunity 
to move forward on the program that uh, the, the Prime Minister is putting in place to address the urgent economic challenges and then ultimately uh, to, uh, uh, to have uh, greater stability uh, and a stronger economic foundation uh, going forward. And that's what we're in conversations about with uh, many friends and partners and something that we talked about just a few moments ago. Thank you. Our last question from Ben Hall at Fox. Secretary. Thank you. Um, this week, the UAE Foreign Minister, Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nayyan, a key U.S. ally, met in Damascus with the Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad. The UAE is just one of a few U.S. allies starting to normalize relations with Syria. But shouldn't the administration here be doing more to discourage allies from building relationships with this brutal regime? And if indeed you did discourage them, what does that say about the relationship with the UAE that your ally was not listening to you on that subject? Uh, it also emerged this week, Secretary, that for the first time, there are dozens of family members of American troops stuck in Afghanistan. How is that? Why was this not known beforehand? How many are abandoned there, and how much concern is it that there are family members of U.S. troops stuck in Afghanistan at a time when the Taliban is looking for anyone who is working with uh, or indeed related to uh, U.S. interests? And also one question on Ethiopia, where the government has arrested some U.S. nationals as part of its anti-Tigrayan crackdown, and they're threatening to punish Ethiopian staff working for the U.N. and for the African Union for law-breaking. Are you concerned about these arrests of Tigrayans, and is civil war in Ethiopia, in your opinion, inevitable? And Sheikh Altani, what do you make of the UAE foreign minister's visit to Syria? Do you think it is right that countries should be normalizing relations uh, with that country? And also, why has Qatar felt the need to limit Afghans transiting through Doha by requiring them to have passports that the Taliban won't issue at a time when a humanitarian crisis, as you say, is looming? And I wondered if you could clarify also your relationship with Iran, your neighbor across the Gulf. Are they ally? Are they adversary? And have you discussed this with the U.S.? Where do they stand on your relationship? Thank you. Excellent demonstration of the multi-part uh, question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so on, uh, on Syria, um, I tell you, we're concerned about the signals that um, some of these visits and engagements uh, uh, are sending. And I would simply urge all of our um, partners to uh, remember uh, the crimes that uh, the Assad regime has committed and indeed continues uh, to commit. Uh, we don't support uh, normalization. Uh, and um, again, we would uh, emphasize to, uh, to our friends and partners uh, to consider the signals that, that they're sending. Um, we, uh, when it comes to uh, Afghanistan and the, uh, the second question, uh, we've been taking out uh, Afghan families of U.S. service members uh, all along. Uh, and that will continue. And as we identify uh, people who um, are in Afghanistan, including uh, family members of service members uh, who remain there and wish to leave, uh, we will do uh, everything we can to get them out. Um, and again, I would just step back for a moment, if I could, uh, here, because this is in so many ways a, um, uh, a complicated story that I'm not sure the uh, American people fully uh, understood. Just taking American citizens, for example. As you know, uh, starting back in March of uh, this year, well before uh, the President uh, made uh, the uh, end the war, uh, and certainly well before the government and uh, Afghanistan imploded. So back in March, we began to uh, all those we had identified as Americans in, um, in Afghanistan uh, encouraging them and then urging them to, to leave the country. Um, and indeed, by the summer, we were also uh, offering to uh, support, uh, support them if they needed help, for example, in buying a plane ticket. Airport was, uh, was functioning, and we were pressing the community um, that we'd identified to, uh, uh, to leave. Despite 19 messages between uh, March and late July, there were still, at the time, everything imploded, uh, about 6,000 um, people in Afghanistan who had uh, a, a blue passport, uh, who had American citizenship. And as I've said before, there's a very good and understandable reason why, despite everything, uh, roughly 6,000 people remained. And that's because, uh, for virtually all of these people, Afghanistan was their home. This is where they resided. This is where their families were, their extended families were, where they'd made their lives. And making that incredibly wrenching decision to leave, to give up everything you know, 
incredibly hard and difficult. So that's why there were still roughly 6,000 remaining, despite everything, uh, despite our efforts to encourage anyone who had an American citizenship and wanted to leave to take advantage of that. Of those 6,000, virtually all of them were evacuated uh, during uh, the, uh, the couple of weeks of the evacuation. Uh, but there were still some hundreds who, for one reason or another, uh, were not able to get to, uh, uh, to the airport uh, or, uh, or get, on a, get on a flight. And what I committed to uh, the American people, and more important, what President Biden committed to the American people, was to continue um, every effort we could to bring out any American citizen uh, who wanted to leave beyond um, August 31st. There was no deadline to that mission. And that's exactly what we've done. Uh, and as I said uh, earlier, uh, to date, um, since, the, since the, the 31st, since the end of the evacuation mission, uh, we have evacuated uh, roughly 380 uh, Americans. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, as of the 10th of November, all U.S. citizens who have requested assistance from the United States government to depart Afghanistan and who ha we've identified as prepared to depart and having the necessary documents uh, have been given an opportunity to do so. Uh, so this is an effort that will, will, will continue. Um, it's also a picture that changes um, on, a, on a regular basis because what happens is this. Some people who uh, have identified as Americans uh, say uh, nonetheless they don't want to leave because their families, extended families, uh, are in Afghanistan and they want to continue to stay there. Others change their minds uh, and have told us they don't want to leave and then decide that they do want to leave, so that, that, that number changes uh, as well. And still others, uh, since August 31st, have come forward to identify themselves uh, as Americans. So we're, we're going to continue uh, this effort uh, for as long as people uh, want to leave. But as I've said, uh, we made a commitment, we're making uh, good on that commitment, and that of course extends to the family members of U.S. service members who, um, uh, who remain. Um, finally, e Ethiopia. Um, I am very concerned uh, about the potential for uh, Ethiopia to, uh, to implode, uh, given uh, what, we're, um, what we're seeing. Uh, both in Tigray, uh, but also as uh, we have different forces and different ethnic groups uh, that are increasingly uh, at odds. And we are working very closely to uh, support the efforts of the former Nigerian president, Obasanjo, to mediate uh, a way forward uh, with all the Ethiopian parties. We're in extremely uh, regular and close contact with him. We have a Special Envoy uh, Ambassador Jeff Feltman, uh, who is uh, deeply engaged in this. Other uh, key players in the region um, are very much engaged. And I think as each of the different groups uh, is looking at this, um, there, are, there are two paths forward. One path forward is uh, out-and-out conflict, which could lead to the implosion of Ethiopia and spill over into uh, other countries in the region. And that would be disastrous for the Ethiopian people uh, and uh, also for, uh, for countries uh, in the region. Uh, the other path is uh, to halt all of the um, military actions that are, uh, that are currently underway, to sit down, uh, to negotiate a, a real ceasefire, uh, to make sure that humanitarian assistance can get in to all of the regions where people are in need, uh, Tigray, of course, but also uh, people in Amara, uh, the Amoros, others, um, and ultimately uh, to negotiate a, uh, a durable political resolution to uh, the differences that, that have emerged uh, over the last year. I believe that that is still um, not only possible, but necessary, and I can tell you the, the United States is um, working very hard to support all of the efforts that are trying to move Ethiopia in that direction. Well, uh, first of all, regarding <coughs> your question about normalizing with Syria, Qatar position has been uh, very clear. We see that normalizing uh, uh, with, As with Assad regime is, is not a step that we are thinking of or considering uh, right now, and we believe that uh, all the crimes he has committed 
uh, against his own people, he needs to be held accountable. Uh, but also we support the political, political resolution and political transition over there in a peaceful way with the support of the Security Council Resolution 2254. Uh, regarding other countries in the region uh, trying to re-engage and reintegrate uh, Syria, uh, it's, of course they are uh, making their decisions based on their own assessments and their own concern, and this is their sovereign rights. We, we cannot uh, uh, criticize. We, it will be a wishful thinking to have all the countries in their regions united when it comes to the issue of uh, Syria, and we hope that uh, uh, countries will be discouraged from taking further steps with the Syrian regime in order not to uh, undermine uh, the misery of the Syrian people uh, who are uh, what they are and the, what they are living in right now. Uh, Qatar position will remain as it is. We don't see uh, any serious steps by Assad regimes showing his commitment uh, uh, to repair the damage that he made for his own country and for his own people. And as long as he's not taking any uh, serious step, we think that changing the position is not a viable option. Uh, regarding uh, the issue of Afghanistan evacuation and people who are not holding a passport, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, from our perspective and from all other countries' perspective, it's very important to make sure that the right people are evacuated uh, and those people uh, will be uh, checked and vetted uh, from a security point of view. And this is, cannot be cleared unless we have proper and sufficient documentation for that. So uh, it's mainly a security measure that's been taken, but uh, there are exceptions. Uh, if we can get the vetting process uh, done in the right way, then we are accepting some with, without their passport at the condition that they provide the required documents. But we don't want to end up with the wrong people who are left leaving Afghanistan to our countries and going to other countries and then doing something wrong and we will be uh, then responsible for, for such a thing. Uh, regarding our relation with Iran, uh, when you talk about uh, the region relation with Iran, it's different. It has uh, different bases and different dynamics. Iran is our neighbor. Uh, Iran is a country that we need to maintain a good neighborhood relationship with them. And this relationship has never been at the account of our alliance with the US or uh, our relation with, uh, with other countries. Uh, we use this relationship uh, uh, as a good way to engage, uh, to communicate, to facilitate if there are any needs from our allies here in the U.S. that we can support uh, with Iran. And uh, we encourage them, we encourage uh, Iran and the U.S. Uh, to uh, come back to the JCPOA as soon as possible and not, uh, not to escalate. Uh, relationship uh, sometimes uh, uh, it means that it's agreement and disagreement. It's not only an agreement on, on, uh, on everything, but we disagree with Iran and, and policies uh, in the region, different policies in the region, but it doesn't mean that we, uh, we are not engaging with them. We are talking to them, trying to understand each other, trying to narrow uh, uh, the gap, and trying to bring more stability to our region. It's not in anyone's interest, uh, neither Qatar nor our uh, neighbors in the GCC or uh, the United States to have an unstable region. And we don't want to see a nuclear race. So we see that the nuclear issue is a very eminent issue that needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.